beaucoup. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonsoir. It's a great honor to be here in Ottawa. Uh, I want to start by thanking the sponsors and, uh, and welcoming the chance to be with the, the legislators who are here today. It's quite an honor and the Canadian Iranian community and to express my personal condolences for the loss of the Canadian and Iranian and other lives in the shootdown of the Ukrainian jet. Um, obviously, I've been put in the unfortunate position of uh, following Senator Torricelli. It's not the first time. I'm used to it. So I would like to talk about some facts. I'd like to answer the question that many of you have asked. Thank you. Because my journey in studying this issue of the resistance is not just about the resistance, and I mean no offense by saying that. Through the, the eyes of the resistance and through the stories of brave people who have been separated from their relatives in Iran for years and who lost relatives in the torture chambers of Iran, I've, I've been fascinated to understand what is it about this regime that has so threatened all of us for a long time. I go back to graduate studies at the Fletcher School near Boston in 1979 where there were six classmates whose parents uh, were in the regime. They were the children of the Shah. And we watched television every night as their world crumbled, the world changed. We saw Khomeini arrive to a hero's welcome in February of 1980, uh, February 1979 from Paris. And then I was at a security conference when the failed rescue mission to get America's hostages out of Tehran happened, Desert One. Again, a very tough time. I was fortunate to get my first job. I served in five administrations under Presidents Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush in the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House. And early in my career, my portfolio was Lebanon. This sounds like a joke, but when I first started, uh, the colonel said, why don't you handle Lebanon? Nothing ever happens there. Unquote. That was the end of 1981. And so I had a very close-up view of two embassy bombings, the bombing of the U.S. Marines in 1983, TWA-847. Uh, we sent my friend, Lieutenant Colonel Rich Higgins, to work in Unifil. He was kidnapped and killed, and his family watched it all on television in my office with the Commandant of the Marine Corps. We went through a lot of things. And I, I, I kept asking myself, what is it about terrorism? Why would a regime do these things? And so years went by, and after my service was completed, I was a non-attorney advisor at a law firm that was hired by a group in California that wanted to get the MEK off the terrorism list in the United States. I'm not a lobbyist. I said I wouldn't lobby, but I was the chairman of a think tank, the Stimson Center in Washington, and I knew the community. So I investigated all the Middle East experts. What did they say about the MEK? I think you know the answer. They're terrorists. They're a cult. They're Marxists who somehow combine Marxism and Islam. They're untrustworthy. Don't believe a word they say. They're brainwashed by these remarkable cult figures, uh, Masood and Maryam Rajavi. Uh, stay away from them. Uh, they're traitors. They fought for Saddam Hussein against their own countrymen. These, are, these were common allegations. So I was sent to Paris. I went to a rally in 2011, and it was an astonishing sight, as we've heard. Uh, first of all, the dignitaries who were there, there were high officials, former officials from Canada, from the United States, from many other countries, which really opened my eyes. I asked a continuous stream of questions and began reading the literature about the MEK. There was one effort, people like Senator Torricelli and others who would give powerful speeches criticizing the regime and calling for a reevaluation of the MEK. There were publications that said the same thing. I thought to myself, this is one effort, but the State Department and maybe the, fo the foreign um, office here is not really listening, or they've, they've, they've become inured to the criticism. Nothing changes their opinion. They still want to find a rapprochement with the regime, and I think that's, that's the case. We've seen that, no matter what Iran's regime does. The, the, the foreign ministries of the West have all tried to keep engaging Tehran in some way. So one conclusion is that terrorism actually worked. It intimidated the rest of the world into saying, keep your distance, don't push them too hard, uh, see if you can find a way to arrange a diplomatic entente with them and hope for the best. That's what we've seen for 40 years. But what I have found in looking deeper into the documents is that I couldn't square the evidence with the allegations. And so my initial piece of work 
as a, a non-expert was to take 10 allegations and, and try to find Western sources, whether it was clips from Le Monde and Italian newspapers and uh, the Washington Post in the 1970s, and to show what, we, what really happened instead of the MEK killing Americans in the streets of Tehran or taking over the embassy or uh, conducting a whole range of, of terrorist activities. So this was more a, an exercise in raising questions, saying, read, these, read these, these 10 essays and ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? The evidence wasn't just a little bit off, but the truth was far from the allegations. And that got me really interested. And since then, I've actually been doing this on my own time. It's been uh, in close cooperation with our friends in Paris and in Albania. I trust them. They've never lied to me. They've shared a lot of sensitive information. And they know that I'm trying to find out what is it about this Iran regime? Are they really so strong? And my conclusion is no, they're actually acting out of desperate fear. They're, they, are, they have a real problem of legitimacy. And I want to walk you through what I learned. Uh, I found that the critics in the West were like landmines. If you make one mistake talking about the MEK, they'll say, ah, you forgot about this terrorist activity. Therefore, you're just a shill for these terrorists. So I, I put together this small volume in 2013, which was a history of 50 plus years of the MEK. And I wrote it, to be honest, although it's a tribute to many who have died, I wanted people to understand that, that it's really written for intelligence analysts. They can look up any terrorist act and say, this is what really happened. This is the real evidence. It's a primer. And if you go through this, you realize that what we've been told by our governments is so at odds with the reality that it really makes you think twice. And six or seven years have passed since then. And even now, two weeks ago, the New York Times put out a large feature-length piece that repeated all the same old things, unchanged. Not that I have any great influence, but it's remarkable to me that four court cases, not just the United States uh, District Court of Appeal in Washington, D.C., the European Union, which, by the way, tried to take them off the terrorism list three or four times, and the foreign ministers of the EU kept reclaiming, saying, no, 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 please don't take them off the list. The same thing happened with the British. It went to the higher court, and if you read the opinion from the superior court in the UK, they're literally angry with the foreign ministry. Uh, they're, they're, and I think there was, a, there was also impatience in Washington as well. Secretary of State Clinton was the one who lifted them from the list, but in her office the day before she did it, she realized that no one had come up with a legitimate basis to keep the MEK on the terrorism list, and she said, I will not be embarrassed by the court, take them off. Then came the French. You may have heard of a spectacular arrest in 2003, over 100 members of the NCRI, the National Council of Resistance on Iran, which boiled down to some 25 odd people, the top people in the organization, were on trial for eight years. And at the end of it, in 2011, the magistrate concluded that not only were they not terrorists, but there had not been any terrorism in their history. There was armed struggle, but it was legitimate resistance to tyranny. They never targeted civilians. They never targeted uh, people, women and children, uh, and, and they, they only targeted the government. And then they made a decision in 2001 to end armed resistance. So now we're going on 19 years of political activity. And if you want to call 19 years of political activity terrorism, you're welcome to it. I would disagree with you. So this is why I wrote a monograph a year ago, and I'm not trying to sort of uh, sell my works here. I don't go to it anyway. But this is, this is a, an essay that goes deeper. Why do we want to know the history of Masoud Rajavi? Why do we want to know what really happened in the Iran-Iraq war, or with Mossadegh, for that matter? And I will tell you why if you just give me another minute or two. So Americans have been riddled with guilt because we overthrew the nationalist prime minister, Mohammed Mossadegh. But guess what? The mullahs, the ayatollahs at the time, supported the Shah. They supported the coup. They wanted Mossadegh to get the death penalty. Sound familiar, the death penalty? So, you know, for them to be criticizing us now, tut, 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 from Zarif, you're the people who overthrew our government, you shouldn't have anything to do with Iranian affairs. Stop meddling in our affairs. Now, the clerics supported the coup. Now, in 1981, 
the Americans were watching the hostages every night. And the day we got them back, when Ronald Reagan was sworn in, uh, we turned the channel. No one wanted to hear about Iran again. And we missed an amazing evolution. We thought Khomeini had been swept in by popular acclaim. He had. In Paris, some of you may have been in Paris with Khomeini. I think some people I've met today were in Paris with him. He talked about democracy. He talked about what the Iranian people want. As soon as he got into Tehran, he had a secret plan. He had a constitution. And the one Persian phrase which we all know is veliat ifaqi. It's the key to the entire constitution of this group, the guardianship of the Islamic jurist. What does that mean? It means that the 12th Imam of the Prophet is in occultation, and until such time as he reappears on earth, the supreme leader of Iran is the divine embodiment of the descendant of the Prophet. That's pretty powerful when you're talking to parliamentarians and you know the government and the president, Rouhani, and we're going to have elections and the justice ministry. Anyone you want can be killed, arrested, tortured, taken off the ballot. It's supreme power. So they've had a dictatorship. Now, let's talk about Masood Rajavi. You, you, you'd think he was some kind of wild terrorist, sort of a, a Carlos, a, some a madman. No, he came from a, you've seen his brother's poster out there, Kazim Rajavi, a man with two doctorate degrees from Paris and Geneva, who served as the revolutionary ambassador in Geneva until it became clear that his brother, Masood, would not support this revolutionary constitution. Khomeini wanted Masood Rajavi's support. He invited him to Gom in late 1979. I've spoken with people who were in the room and witnessed the conversation. I wrote about it because the State Department wasn't there, so I did them a favor. What happened is Khomeini said, Islam, you should be supporting Islam. You, this, you're a natural, your support is needed here. And Masood Rajabi said, Islam means freedom. And you know this isn't what people re revolted for. They didn't go through all of this change just to have another dictatorship. And so that conversation was the pivotal moment at which Khomeini then hand wrote a fatwa for the death of Masoud Rajavi. He was the only person not allowed to run for president. This is the only presidential election where you had 99.9% .9 candidates on the ballot. Today it's less than half of 1%. So I can give you the chart. It, there, there's no democracy in Iran. It's, it's an insulting illusion to look at the way they put on these elections as if there's a veneer of legitimacy. There is not. And so they elected Bani Sadr. Well, what happened with Bani Sadr? He and Rajavi had cheering throngs of people. They gave lectures about the freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the freedom of Islam. And what happened is the mullahs thought that they were going to be overthrown. They were on the verge of being swept aside the way the Shah had been swept aside. And so they shot their way to power in June of 1981. They, they arrested, uh, they, they impeached Bani Sadr. They executed three of his closest friends. They closed down his newspaper. He fled into secrecy with, Ma with Masoud Rajabi, and they made it to Paris. And that's when a reign of terror began. The Ayatollahs were shooting their way to power to try to suppress this group. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, the MEK is the one and only resistance group that the regime is against. <laughs> And this is key. Unlike other groups, the monarchists and others, it's not just a political critique that says, well, this is too much of a dictatorship. We need a more democratic, we need a more democratic model. It's a religious critique. Masood Rajavi was defining an Islam that was entirely different from Ayatollah Khomeini's 12er Shia Islam. And when you take when you say, I'm sorry, I, I reject your political blueprint, but I also don't accept your religious credentials. That is war. And we've seen 40 years of war. So if you want to understand the Iranian regime, you must understand the MEK. So let's look at what happened after that. You hear about the Iran-Iraq war. I'm going to surprise you if you don't know this. Many of you have heard from everyone who will speak, all the Iran hands and the think tanks. Oh, they're traitors. They, they fought against their own country. How many people knew that before Iraq invaded Iran in September 1980. There were probably 110 attacks in southern Iraq coming from Khomeini and his forces. Assassinations, small bombings. They were trying to take over Najaf and Karbala, holy cities in Shiism, which are more important than any of the cities in Iran. 
Khomeini had this grand plan. He'd lived there in Najaf for 14 years. He was, he was committing small, waging small-scale terrorism. He called Khomeini the puppet of Satan. Others called the clerics, said we should overthrow, the clerics were saying we should overthrow Saddam Hussein, and Saddam invaded in September of 1980. I'm not carrying water for Saddam Hussein. I'm saying that future historians will have a more balanced picture. That Khomeini kept poking him in the eye and then they invaded. What happened next? The MEK fighters went to the front line to fight against Iraq. They fought for their country. And the regime wanted them pulled out of there because it was bad propaganda. They didn't want the MEK to get credit for being nationalist patriots. Many of these MEK were captured as prisoners of war. Now, if you think that the MEK was fighting on Saddam's side during the Iran-Iraq war, why were those prisoners of war held by Iraq in captivity until 1989? Answer me that. The answer is that not once during any battle between Iraq and Iran did the MEK play a role or fire a bullet, not once. In fact, they weren't even in Iraq until June of 1986, nearly six years after the war started. So what are people talking about? And then they say that they paid cash for excess weapons. Saddam did not give them to them. I can't prove that, but they have the receipts if you want to see them. And they announced their military capability a year later, 1987. By the time they went into Iran to try to overthrow the government in Operation Eternal Light, and many of you have relatives, I'm sure, who were involved in 1988, the Iran-Iraq war was in a ceasefire. It was, they didn't participate in the war at all. This is a myth. It's a, it's, it's a calumny against the MEK. They are not traitors. And why were they in Iraq, ladies and gentlemen? 